This book, Scorch Atlas, fundamentally changed the way I approach my own writing, um, just for its playfulness. So um, I will read a couple of, I guess they're prologues to his own separate stories. Each story has its own little miniature vignette. Um, I'll read a couple of those and then I will read some of my own. This one's called Dust. Dry flakes of charcoal came big as men's heads, slather from some great fire overhead. The ash rained black into the evening, clung against the mud as some new second skin. Each inch sat spackled, crusted over. Each inhale brought a mouthful. The streets intoned with coral wheeze and incensed hiccup. We made face masks our, out of old newspapers. The current editions no longer came. The mail service had gone under. One minor blessing, I stopped receiving bills. The finer dust came down in curling spigots. The sick began to bundle, hung at home. Count emphysema, count belabored lungs, as well asthma, croup, and coughing. The air so thick we called it paste. Strung among the gusts came reams of loose hair. Blonde or black streamers stole from sore heads. Cells clogged the chimney, laced the evening. Though the TV went out again in interference, radioed men spoke the wreckage even in our sleep. Whole apartment buildings ransacked in skin flakes. Baseball stadiums filled at the brim. The faces of lakes and oceans so thick that you could walk forever. The plumes of powder flew over our yards. It beat against our windows, making bass. I learned to breathe in smaller rhythms. The incubated heat swelled so high outside you'd sweat forever, then more dust. Eyes encrusted, nostrils clogged. One night, finally, the roof over my living room succumbed to all the weight. Somewhere in there, under all that danger, I often would regret I had not been. And this one's called Ink. Hard to decipher in its squall, the long squirts of liquid and stretched blue pyramids descending on the yard. Soon the windows streaked so thick you could no longer trace your name. The house was full of drip, the chimney glutted, the ceiling leaking. The sinks overflowed a new pool on the carpet. What books could have been written with this excess? What squid would hide from light? Out on the back porch, the level rose to lap the welcome mat. You couldn't see into the street. Everything clogged and burped and sobbing. The surface reflected whatever peered into it. Overhead, some sound like choking, gooed helicopters, gummy birds. The seas were heavy somewhere. I scratched my cheek and half expected the unctuous gleam to come pouring out of me. Instead, my blood, several shades of brown. I slept what hours I could manage. I waited to wake up to something clean. In the nights when the dripping swung low, we climbed onto the roof to try to see the city. A blubbered dot hung from the sky, a runny, rotten, murdered thing, a billion voices buried beneath, all saying the same thing over and over, smothered out. <clears throat> and now I'll read from uh, two separate stories. The first couple of passages um, are all vignettes um, from a piece called Trauerspielen, Morning Play. Not like morning and night, but morning is in sadness. <coughs> I am the rock face, the culmination of the world's age, the sediment of eons pressed together by time, movement, and gravity. I am that which breaks the skin and scrapes the bones. I have tasted generations of blood, kept the remnants in pockets of amber and solitude. I have seen the sweeping away of civilizations, the propagation of new ones, themselves swept away and replaced a hundred times over. The lessons never change, the people never learn. I am the erosion, the unseen forces of wind and water nibbling away at the edges. I am the drown and the suffocation, the choke and the asphyxiation. I am the weightlessness of tides, I am the unstoppable force of displacement. I am the pebble moved from great heights, I am the divot carved in earth stone. I am the scree and the detritus blown across hard pan. I am the whisper you never truly see, never truly hear. I am the song, the spirit, and the silence. I am that which moves between worlds effortlessly, the first breath of life and the final exhalation in death. I am the music of the newly birthed child's scream, the proclamation of life's arrival. I am the notion, the idea, the halo and the horns. I am the sound of leaves on limbs in the wind. I am the sound of clouds passing overhead. I am the tune the sun hums as it sinks below the horizon. I am the cacophony of starlight, the chaos of a silent winter day. I am the wisp of snowflake falling onto tongue. I am the discordant tune of thaw in the spring. I am melt. The 
quivering sigh of a napping infant, the soft rustling of fingers through hair, the vibration of the hummingbird, the gentle shifting of heavy leaf-heavy tree limbs, the slow ripple of water against submerged boulder, the light kiss planted on sleeping lover's shoulder, the lifting of gulls in mid-glide, the scattering of dandelion seeds across a meadow, the sound of bloom as petals unfurled, the sound of fallout happening three counties over. The grandmother lit candles in the windows to keep the memories at bay. She kept the fire stoked in the hearth to keep the ghosts from leaving. She set the kitchen sink on fire, kept it roaring while she slept, for fear the nightmares would creep up from the darkness through the pipes and finally steal her away. She soaked the door jams and hinges with gasoline, lighter fluid, grain alcohol, gunpowder. She singed the hems of all her dresses that they hung in the closet, hoped the char and ash would make her a protection charm against the things she could not see, but hovered around her every hour of the day. The electric blankets were turned up high, mottled and blistered her skin as she slept, but she would wake and that was proof that it was right. She would sleep in fire, she would dream of fire, she would walk awake with thoughts of fire and smoke and feel her lungs close up in fear of the things the fire kept away. She made necklaces of matches, earrings from inflammable tips. She hung wind chimes made of old grenade pins and hung them around the porch to ward off the beasts she saw in dreams. She made lamps of propane tanks and welding equipment, took baths in paint thinner and sulfur. And these next couple are from um, a piece called Only So Far. <clears throat> Some learned to speak the language of fire, spoke in tongues of flame, tasted heat and ate in hellish burn. Their voices were ash and soot, their eyes betraying hyperviolence, their fingers twitching and in need of heat. Nimble with wires and timers, hands flew across containers and tape and bits of nail and screw, ball bearings and hurt, compacted into hand-sized packages. Some learned to harness anger and madness in the time of anger and madness. The silence before the booms made tension, crackled up spines, up into craniums, tickled nervous systems in awkward ways, little spurts of voltage climbing up backs and muscle. The sound of nothing echoed off long, empty basketball courts and cul-de-sacs, vacant apartment buildings and businesses already half-blown to char. The air was fat with possibility. Death hung like fog across neighborhoods. Uncle got caught in the beginning. No one could tell amongst all the rubble, but he stepped wrong on a trash can lid, became supernova there in the middle of the street. He became starlight, orange and white, smoke and flame, alpha and omega all in one instant. We never knew who left that one for him to find, but it didn't matter. Soon everyone was a firebug. Everyone had a missing limb, a missing friend or relative, a missing pet, all blown skyward and scattered across the dying city, little clouds of flesh and red. We were all part phantom. Mother became martyr. Weary of hiding, we strapped flame to her body and hid it beneath fabric finery, robes, a t-shirt for my childhood. She called out to them. They came, surrounded her, smelled her as victim as she feigned fear. They circled, grinned. Saliva dripped from snarling lips. Blackened fingers reached out to grab her. She did not scream. She did not flinch. In the moment before loudest silence, they saw the fire in her eye, they turned to run, felt the ground shake beneath them as she unleashed her own Prometheus Valentine upon them. The streets are quieter now. The city naps longer, and so do we. We awoke and drowned, lungs full of flood, restless, placental. We floated in the home, watched our life swim by and sink below us. Fractured picture frames, unpaid bills, the family pet, good china, building blocks, a dimly lit lamp still plugged into the rotting wall glowing beneath the surface. The brick house eroded from the inside, the insulation tearing like dead tissue. Our bodies filled, bloated, dead whitened. Fingers plumped like sausage, broke wedding rings. Shirts stretched, tore, ripped with the sound of soft breath and broken lovers' hearts. On the wall, the children's heights, marked in pencil and pen, slowly being erased. I screamed at the vanish, inhaled more water, forgot the names of my children. The wall clock cracked under pressure, the big hand between twelve and one, the little hand hung limp in the current, swinging between five and seven. We could hear the chimes faintly through the water, fighting tide and flow. Water filled my orifices, clogged my nose, my ears, found ways past my eyes and filled my skull. 
I could feel me bubble up from inside, liquid fill rising. I heard the waves crash against the arterial walls inside me, collapsing against bloodlines and pumping organs. Water mixed with blood, mixed with water, mixed with blood. The phone floated, floated by. I put it to my ear, heard sea sirens on the other end, scream whispering as if a universe away. You have our deepest sympathies, our condolences. You have such a lovely home. The picture is heartbreaking. Your clock is broken. You are drowning. The water kept me, floated me, bumped me into the ceiling and the chandelier and other furniture. I let the phone sink to the floor, watched its hypnotic drowning, a spiraling downward. My wife was sending the children up the chimney, motioned for me to join. I wouldn't fit and she knew it. Our eyes locked, our fishy lips locked, held each other until the bloat made that impossible and soon she was gone. I floated there in the quiet roar, watched our things float and sink and move away before sitting in the chair still by the fireplace. I waited for the return I knew wasn't coming. My skin began to prune, spoil, suck in on itself, and I waited. Thank you.